but the three tea ships which came into Boston Harbor fell into the hands of Samuel Adams and his followers. And then the trouble began. The Cosignees in this case were five in number, including the two sons of Hutchinson, the governor, who, like their father, were devoted loyalists, believing in the supremacy of the British Empire and regarding American independence as a delusion and a crime. They would not resign. Town meetings were held upon them, committees visited them, violence was threatened, but they were firm. They did not, however, attempt to land the cargoes. The Patriots placed a guard over the ships, and six horsemen held themselves ready to alarm the country towns. The radicals were determined to begin the active revolution at this point. The owners and captains of the ships were willing to take the tea back to England, but the custom house officers would not give the ships a clearance until they had discharged their tea. Governor Hutchinson gave instructions that no ship should be allowed to pass the castle outward bound unless it had a permit, and he would not issue a permit unless the vessel first showed a clearance. Meanwhile, during these disputes, the 20 days were passing. Some patriots advised moderation, and there was a strong loyalist minority. But the party of violence was in the ascendant. The town was placarded with liberty posters. Riders were posting back and forth from the neighboring towns, and the country people were beginning to flock into Boston. The common statements in some of our histories that Governor Hutchinson was the vacillating and cowardly agent of tyranny are utterly without foundation. If he had been cowardly, he would have given the ships a permit, let them return to England, and thus have postponed the revolution for another three or four years. He acted consistently with his own opinions and the conciliatory policy of the government. He abstained from any use of the men of war in the harbour, or of the two quote-unquote Sam Adams regiments that were still down at the castle, where quote-unquote Sam had put them. He allowed the Patriots themselves to guard the tea ships. The warships or the soldiers could have taken possession of the tea ships and prevented all that happened. But British sovereignty was on this occasion a mere spectre and visitor in its own dominions. The difficulty may have been settled as in Charleston, by allowing the customs officials to seize the tea at the end of the 20 days. No one would have had the temerity to buy it and it would then have been stored till it rotted. In fact, the Cosignees offered to have it stored until they should receive instructions from the East India Company what to do with it. But Adams and his people were too hot to take such chances. They were planning an outbreak, a truly Boston and Massachusetts outbreak, which would be self-restrained and yet sufficiently violent to force both England and America to an open contest on the great question which lay beneath all the past eight years of wrangling. They prepared everything for action on the night of the 16th of December, because two days after that, the 20 days limit would expire on the quote-unquote Dartmouth, which had been the first ship to arrive. 7,000 people filled the Old South Meeting House on that afternoon, while Roch, the Quaker owner of the quote-unquote Dartmouth, drove out to Milton to Governor Hutchinson's country place to ask him for a permit to pass the castle. Everyone knew or felt confident that the permit would be refused, so that this meeting cannot be called a deliberative one. Darkness came on, and still the meeting waited. At last, Roch returned, and made the formal announcement that the permit had been refused. Samuel Adams arose, and gave the signal that had evidently been agreed upon, quote, This meeting can do nothing more to save this country, unquote. Immediately, as has so often been related, the war whoop was heard, or resounded, I believe, in the usual expression outside the door. Some forty or fifty men painted and disguised as Indians, and with hatchets in their hands, suddenly appeared from some place place where they had been waiting, and rushed down to the tea ships directly encouraged by Adams, Hancock, and the other patriots. The crowd formed around them as a protection, and posted guards about the wharf to prevent interference while the Indians worked with their hatchets. It is said that the vast crowd was perfectly silent, a most respectful Boston silence and not a sound could be heard for three hours save the cracking of the hatchets on the chests of tea in all three ships. 
At the end of that time, every pound of tea was in the water, and the proceedings, so like a great deal of our lynch law, were ended. It was a serious business for the people concerned, but now that we are too far away to feel the seriousness, it seems really comical. The most comical part of it was that the Indians claimed particular credit for not having injured any other property on the ships, and declared that, quote, all things were conducted with great order, decency, and perfect submission to the government, unquote. Our ancestors had a fine sense of humor. From the point of view of Samuel Adams, I suppose, there never was a piece of liberty or revolutionary rioting that was so sagaciously and accurately calculated to affect its purpose and not go too far. If it had been very violent disorder or brutality, it might have alienated moderate or doubtful patriots whom it was important to win over. But it was so neat, gentle, pretty, and comical that to this day it can be described in school books without much danger of the children at once seeing that it was a riotous breach of the peace, a lawless violation of the rights of private property, and an open defiance of the governmental authority. In England, however, the violence of it was sufficiently apparent to break up for a time the conciliatory policy and to bring upon the Massachusetts colonists such punishment as the radical patriots hoped would arouse the fighting spirit. It is possible that it was intended as an example which would be followed in one or two other colonies and thus bring on a general punishment that would arouse them all. But that did not happen. It had no effect on the Philadelphians who, more than a week afterwards, quietly and without any violence, sent their tea ship back to England. The time on the Charleston ship expired December 22nd, and they also, as we have shown, acted moderately. The British government could have nothing to say against the action of those colonies, and the whole punishment was directed against Massachusetts. It was a great event for Samuel Adams. And who was this Samuel Adams, who is so conspicuous in this part of the revolution, and later on almost disappears from view? The portrait we have of him, which has often been reproduced, represents what would seem to be a stout, handsomely dressed, prosperous merchant, with a very firm chin and jaw, proud of his wealth and success, and proud of his long-tested ability in business. Unfortunately, the only part of this portrait which is true to life is that iron-like jaw. Samuel Adams was not a merchant, was seldom well-dressed, was not at all proud, and never rich. He was always poor. He failed in his malting business, was unthrifty and careless with money, and had, in fact, no liking for or ability in any business except politics. He lived with his family in a dilapidated house on Purchase Street, and when in 1774 he was elected a delegate to the Continental Congress at Philadelphia, his admirers had to furnish the money to make him look more respectable. All this assistance Adams was not too proud to accept. He had long been engaged in small local politics, and when tax collector had been short in his accounts and threatened with ruin. The Patriots, of course, forgave him this lapse, which was not repeated, but Englishmen and Loyalists never forgot it. When coupled with his shiftlessness and shabbiness and the gifts of money and clothes to make him presentable in the Congress, it is easy to understand the indignation, contempt and disgust which were entertained for him by those who were opposed to the rebellion. Such a disloyal and dishonest movement, they would say, naturally had a shabby rascal for its leader. On the other hand, Adams was a man of good education, and the public documents he prepared show considerable ability. His speeches, though at times somewhat turgid and violent, seem to have been well suited to their purpose. He was a most competent politician and a good organizer of agitation. He understood the temper of the people from the bottom up, and was so skillful in drawing the ship caulkers into the revolution movement that some trace to this source the origin of our word caucus. An account of his language and advice to such people to fight England, to, quote, destroy every soldier that dare put his foot on shore, unquote, and that, quote, we shall have it in our power to give laws to England, unquote, has been preserved, and by the English law it was pure treason.
Adams had a constitutional tremulousness of his head and hands, which did not improve loyalist opinion of him. He was one of those men whom we call a devoted and enlightened patriot, or slippery scoundrel, conspirator and fanatic, according as we are on the side of the government or of the rebellion. His best ability was shown in agitation in the early stages of the revolution, in attending to the small details of organization, while men of larger capacity were still partially absorbed in their business or professions. That charmingly ingenuous statement that all the hatchet work on the tea ships had been done, quote, in perfect submission to government, unquote, had no mitigating effect in England. The destruction by a mob of over 15,000 pounds worth of tea, the private property of the East India Company, awoke Parliament from its dream of conciliation. That the mob had been guided by respectable and wealthy men like Hancock, Molyneux, Warren and Young, who prevented uproar and noise and enforced decency and order, made it all the worse in English eyes. Parliament and the Ministry resolved at all hazards and at any cost to establish British sovereignty in America. Leniency and conciliation had been carried too far.